Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ruel Barkdell, and I am the host of Walking Through the Book of Exodus. Today, we're going to be looking at the 14th chapter of this phenomenal book. And this is a book that we, this is a chapter that we've been waiting for in great anticipation because this is the chapter when the children of Israel who have been in bondage for 430 years who couldn't find a way out, weren't able to worship God in, in the beauty of, of what God had told them to be, weren't able to praise him, weren't even allowed to go out into the wilderness for a moment to praise him. Now they walk out of Egypt, and the Egyptians will never, ever, ever bother them again. Listen, there's going to be a time whenever it's bothering you, whatever is holding you back, whatever is keeping you from being what God has called you to be, there will be a moment. When God will say, you will never see them again. You will never see it again. It will never hold you down again. It will con- it will not continue to be a stronghold in your life because it will not no longer, it will no longer hold you strongly. So get your Bible, get paper, get pencil as we walk through this 14th chapter of the book of Exodus. Now listen, we as as is our custom, we you know, we always gotta set up something. We we can't just go into the word. We we gotta we gotta put it in context. And so tonight, in order for us to put it in context, I'm going to go all the way to the book of Daniel. All the way to the book of Daniel. Now, if we were to maybe put a title on tonight, it would be keep walking in faith when you can't see the way. Keep walking in faith even when you can't see the way. There may be moments of time where what God has told you to do, it seems problematic because you you, you don't see the end of the road. You, you don't see the promised land. You, you don't see how things are going to work out for you. But You've got to know that you know that you know that God's got you. Whatever is torturing you right now in your life, whatever is having you up crying at night, whatever has you fearful, whatever has you afraid, God's got you. If you keep your hand in his hand, you'll be all right. God's got you. And so I want to show you uh, an example of that kind of faith. In the book of Daniel, the third chapter, we'll start with verse 15. And the background is King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he was one of those politicians like we have today that think everybody ought to bow when they walk into the room. He, He thought that he was a God. He thought that he was different. He thought that when I do something, everybody needs to stop what they're doing and bow down. And so he had, you know, he had this edict. He he had this law drawn up, said, look, when you hear music, I don't care who you are, where you are, what you're doing, I want you to bow down to the gods that I put in front of you. That's one of the reasons why we have to be careful about the kind of music that we listen to. Because music music is in the atmosphere with a purpose. Sometimes when when you go to a boxing match, the music is is loud and it's energetic because they want to put you in that frame of mind. When you go to a hospital, the the music is soft and soothing because that's where they want you to be. I had a student once that was a bartender that told me, he said, Professor Barksdale, I can tell how many fights we're going to have in the bar by the kind of music that we play. Music is not neutral. But anyway, Nebuchadnezzar said, all right, when you hear the lyre, when you hear the harp, when you hear the pipes, when you hear the horn and the flute, you, you, you better bow and worship the, 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 the things that I put in front of you. And if you don't, there's a blazing furnace waiting for you. So, so Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were sold out to God. They worshiped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They worship the God of the Passover. They worship the God that would that would take the Israelites out of Egypt. They were sold out. Nebuchadnezzar comes to them and asks them a question because he had heard some stuff about them being, you know, worshiping a different kind of God. Is, is, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of the gold that I have set up? Now listen, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, 
the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, huh, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego now have a choice. Oh, my God, he's, he's, he's going to kill us if we don't do what he asks us to do. But this is the reply that they gave to the king. O Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 3, verse, verse 16 of the book of Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego applied to the king. Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We, we, we're not trying to make a defense. We're not trying to say, I'm sorry. We're not trying to say, well, look, this, this is why we did what we did. We, we ain't doing all, any of that. But this is what we need you to know. And then they gave him three statements of faith. And the question again tonight is, can you walk by faith when you can't see the way out? When you can't see the road? When you can't see the victory? Will you still walk by faith? And this is what they told him. Statement number one. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. Statement of faith. We, we, we know who we serve. We know who we bow down to. And the God that we serve, he, he's able to save us from the fiery furnace. Can you believe that whatever you're going through tonight in your life, Whatever is bothering you, whatever has you bound, whatever has you crying in the middle of the night, whatever has you feeling isolated, whatever is torturing you, torturing you, can you believe that God is able? Second thing that they say to the king, and he will, he will save us from it. Second statement of faith. He, look, king, we, we, we're not worried about you. Statement one, number one, God is able. Statement number two, and he will. But this is what blew my mind when I heard it. Statement number three, and even if he doesn't, we ain't bowing down and worshiping the God that you serve. We will not worship your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was furious. And you know the rest of the story. He, he, he threw them into the furnace. And God did just like they believed he would do. He saved them. And they, they walk out of the fiery furnace. They didn't even smell like smoke. My brother and my sister, some of you are going through some things tonight that, that should harm you, should damage you, should hurt you. But when you walk out of the furnace, you won't even smell like smoke because God is just God and he's got you. He's got you that way. Now, uh, President Obama, in his book, The Audacity of Hope, The Audacity of Hope, makes a profound statement. He says that faith is not the absence of doubt. Oh no, don't don't beat yourself up because you you don't you can't see the ending and you're afraid that you, you have doubt. But that what you what you and I have to do is can we keep walking in faith even when doubt is hovering around us? Can we keep walking because we know that God is able? We know that God will, and I'm afraid because I haven't been here before, haven't seen this before, don't know how this I I I I I can I keep walking when I can't see the way? When we have fear, there's three things that we need to do. Sometimes fear will cause you to retreat. You, you'll want to go back to what you used to know. You'll want to go back to the habits that you used to have. You'll want to go back to the friends that you used to run with. But when God calls you to a higher level, sometimes you, you, you've got to make sure that you, you, you're focused on looking forward to where you're going, not where you've been. Second thing, sometimes we, we have fear, but sometimes we're impatient. Impatience will tell you that you must do something now. Don't know what I'm going to do, but I'll do something. Sometimes when we're in a situation where we've not been before, we have fear. Sometimes we have, that causes us to retreat. Sometimes the fear causes us to be impatient. Sometimes the fear causes us to have a presumption that will tell you to jump into the sea, jump into the fray, jump into it. Uh, before we even know what, what we're looking at. But we have to understand that God is our leader. God is our protector. And there's a time to fight. But we're going to see in, this, in the 14th chapter of Exodus, there's a time to be still. And God is going to tell his people, be still 
Know that I am God. Now, you got to understand, I want you to put yourself in their situation. We, we've been walking through Exodus, and we've, we, we've arrived at this 14th chapter, but I want you to put yourself in their shoes. There's two million of them that are leaving Egypt, and they've been as a people in Egypt for 430 years. Bondage is all they know. Slavery is all that they know, and they've been emancipated. But just like your forefathers, my, my forefathers, many of us have, have ancestors that when they were emancipated, they didn't know what to do. And so by faith, they migrated to Cleveland and Newark and Detroit and Chicago and Philadelphia, L.A., not knowing what was in front of them. But they knew where they were was bondage. They knew where they were was enslavement. They knew where they were wasn't what God had created them for. And it took faith for them to leave. As a matter of fact, I would argue it took even faith for those to stay. But God has told them, God has promised their forefathers, I've got a land for you. I've got a promised land for you. And he told Abraham, he told Isaac, he told Jacob, I I've got a place designed for you. And God is telling you, my brother and my sister, he's got a place. I don't know where the place is. And I'm not talking about a physical place. I'm talking about a place of living. I'm talking about a place of freedom. I'm talking about a place where you're allowed and, and capable of being all that God created you to be. That's where, what he wants for the children of Israel. All right, let's go to the, to the 14th chapter of Exodus. I know that was a long introduction, but let's go to the 14th chapter of Exodus and see what we see. The 14th chapter of Exodus talks of God. God is talking to, to Moses. And, and Moses is in a precarious situation too. He'd been gone for 40 years before God tells him to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So the, so the people didn't really know him like that. And yet they're following him. Hmm? They've been in bondage for 430 years and bondage was all they knew. They're afraid of Pharaoh because he's been a, a horrific taskmaster. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi Haheroth, between Migal, Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal, Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. So when when see, I'm, I'm gonna change the way y'all are going. And when Pharaoh sees you wandering around, he's going, to go, oh, we got them now. Why do we let them go anyway? Look at them wandering in the desert, running into each other. They don't even know which way they're going. The Israelites, so, and, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them, but I will gain glory. See, at, at the end of the day, what I'm going through, what you're going through, what's torturing you, what's hounding me, it's not about us. It's not about it's not about the people that love you, hate you, despise you. It's not about them. It's about the glory of God. And because I know Pharaoh, I know what he's about. I know after he gets over that 10th plague, he's going to be angry. And I know he's going to so, say, okay, I'm going to help him to do what he wants to do. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. See, it, we started out in the first, second chapter where, where Pharaoh said, who's God? Who's the Lord? What? Do you know who I am? But God is now saying the Egyptians and all of the army will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what, what have we done? We have, we've let the Israelites go and, and have lost their services. I mean, we had free labor. They were our slaves. They were building a, a mighty nation for us. Oh, we've seen that recently. What Emancipation Proclamation, Reconstruction. Oh, no, that's not going to work. Let's, we, we're not going to let them vote. We're not going to let them go to school. We're not going to let them own property. What have we done? All right, well, let's, let's incarcerate them so we can get free labor again, so they can build this country again. That was the mind of Pharaoh. So he had his chariot made up. He took his army with him. 
he took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots. In other words, every chariot he had, especially the best ones, oh, we're going to go get them. We might bring them back. We might kill them. That, that has yet to be seen, but we ain't going to just let them go. The Egyptians, all of the horses and the chariots and the horsemen and the troops pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Harifah, Harathoth. Mm, I can't even tell you. Let's try this one more time. Hiroth. There you go. Hiroth beside Baal Zephon. Now, you, you, now, come on now. Don't act like you wouldn't be afraid. You see all this army, all these chariots, all these horsemen, all, all these people with bad intentions with swords and spears and, and helmets and armor coming at you and you on foot. You don't have a horse. You don't have a chariot. You see them coming and they're angry because because God didn't kill their firstborn and they're they going to take it out. They're going to kill us out here in the desert. They're afraid. Question again, can you keep walking in faith when you can't see the way? As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. Now, their, their first instinct was right. When you're terrified, you should cry out to God. But you should also know that God, you, you got to know that you know, no, no matter what I feel, God's got me. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here in the desert to die? What have you done bringing us out of Egypt? In other words, sometimes we go back to what had us bound because that's, that's all we knew. All we knew was the addiction. All we knew was hanging out with the people on the corner. All we knew was the relationships that were no good for us. All we knew was a lifestyle that wasn't allowing us to worship God in the way he has created us. All, that's all we knew. And sometimes we, we, we want to go back to what we were and that does not allow us to be what God wants us to become. God's got a promised land for them, but they can't see the promised land. All they can see is slavery because that's, and slavery has got to be worse than having these horsemen, having these chariots chase us down in the desert. Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the desert, Moses. Moses answered the people, I, I, I don't want you to retreat. God is not telling us to do that. I don't want you to be impatient and take things in your hand. God's not telling us to do that. I don't want you just to make some, some presumptions and, and go left, right, or forward. God doesn't want us to do that. God is saying, don't be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see them again. Oh God, that's a good word. I, I don't know what is, is, is torturing you right now. I don't know what you're wrestling with right now. I don't know what has you bound right now. But there will come a time where God will say, you will never see that again. Can you be still and let God be God? Can you have enough faith to know that God is able and that he will? So Moses answered the people again, do, do not be afraid, stand still, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord uh, today. The Egyptians you see today, will never, you will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why, why are you crying out to me? This ain't the time for crying. This ain't that time for weeping. You, you about to see something now. I, I need you to tell the Israelites now, now to move on, raise your staff, and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water. Now, you got to know the power to divide the water wasn't in Moses' hand. The power to divide the water wasn't in the rod or the staff. The power to divide the water was in God. But thank God he will use your hands and your feet, your arms, your leg, your obedience to do his will on earth. The Lord cried, the Lord said to Moses, tell, tell the Israelites to move forward, raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can walk through on this walk through the sea on dry ground. 
I will harm the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I, 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 I will gain glory. Not you, Moses. Not the Israelites. See, back in the beginning of Exodus, we, we started by Pharaoh saying, who is God? All right, I'm going to show them. And the things that you're going through, the things that I'm going through, the heartache that I'm going through, the heartache you're going through, it's a God will eventually get the glory. And the things that are torturing the, the Israelites today, oh, you're not going to see the Egyptians anymore, ever. We don't see them fight the Egyptians in the promised land. That's done. They've moved to a higher level. I will harm the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel, do you know that one of my favorite scriptures in, in, in the Bible talks about goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life. When I wake up in the morning, goodness and mercy is there. When I'm going through a victorious moment, goodness and mercy is there. When I'm going through a trial and or tribulation, goodness and mercy is there. When somebody's talking about me behind my back, goodness and mercy is there. When somebody's giving me praise in front of my face, goodness and mercy is there. When I'm on the mountaintop, goodness and mercy is there. When I'm in the valley, goodness and mercy is there. And God has an angel before the children of Israel. And, and in the day, it, he's, there's a pillar of cloud he's, he's showing. In the night, the, there's a pillar of fire. And God is going to dispatch that angel. Look, angel, I want you to go not in front of the two million people that are leaving e Egypt at the time. I want you to go in back. And I want you to stand between my children and the army that's pursuing them. Listen what happens. Um, we're down to... Uh, verse 19, then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of e Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night. Do you know what's light to you is darkness to other people? The word of God that's light to you is darkness to people that don't believe, that aren't a child of God, that have chosen not to believe in the Lord that you serve. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry ground. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground and a wall of water, the first aquarium that's ever recorded in the Bible. You walking on dry ground through the Red Sea. On the right, you see fish and sea, fish and sea animals. On the left, you see whales and, and sharks. And, and you walking and you walking through, they looking at you, you looking at them. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army, and now he threw them into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off. So they tried to put the wheels, but God broke, 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 beat the wheels off of them. He tried. They tried to come, come back, and and they get the wheels back on. Um, the the, the Egyptian. Uh, he made the wheels of of the chariots come off, so that they were had difficulty in driving. And the Egyptians said, "Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt." Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots. It's too late now, Egyptians. You had 10 chances before this to know that God was God. But now you follow him. It's a dangerous thing to chase God's people. It's a dangerous thing to want to do harm to God's children. It's a dangerous thing. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen. The, and the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea not one of them survived. 
But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. My brother and my sister, you're going to come out of this okay. You won't smell like smoke. Your shoes won't be muddy. And those that were following you to harm you, they'll never see, be an issue for you again. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. Those that had enslaved them for 430 years, those that had wished to kill them, those that had wished to put them back into bondage, their, their chariots, their horses, their armor, their swords, their military prowess dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, Egyptians, the people feared not the army of Pharaoh, they feared the Lord. And they put their trust in him and in Moses, their servant. What a word. Listen, I don't know what you're going through, and I don't know what has you bound, but God is God. And what we need to do is we need to have the faith that wherever we are in our life, three things, God is able, God will, and even if he doesn't, we're going to keep walking in faith till we see what the end is going to be. Listen, ooh, what a word. God, God, God's got you. God has you. He sees you. He understands you. He feels your pain. Till next week, tell a friend, tell an enemy about our walk through the book of Exodus. And maybe by the time next week is over, you and your enemy will be friends. I love you. God loves you more. Bye-bye.